Years ago, when we started work on the Beyond Intractability system, we convened a series of conferences in which we brought together experts on various aspects of the problem to talk about what should be included in a comprehensive knowledge base on the subject. And one of the attendees at this conference was a guy named Wendell Jones, who taught me about complex adaptive systems. And the notion here was that it was very useful to divide the world into two fundamentally different kinds of systems, and that doing so would go a long ways toward illuminating the problems posed by intractable conflict. And this was really a transformative experience for me, because we literally have spent the last 10 to 15 years trying to figure out how to essentially retool our approach to conflict problems in a way that focuses on complex adaptive systems. Now, the key to Wendell's argument is the distinction between complicated systems, and complicated systems can be very, very complicated, but they're deterministic. All of the components of a complicated system react to one another and to changing conditions in reliably predictable ways. That is, the laws governing the system, and here we're talking about laws of physics, electronics, chemistry, are stable, and they are applied the same way every time. The other key thing about complicated systems is they don't have a mind of their own. They don't have goals. They have properties, and they react in certain ways, but they don't have their own agenda that determines how they respond to conditions. The way to think about complicated systems is to think certainly of mechanical systems, things that people build, tools and then elaborate machines, and things that we think about using mechanical metaphors, like, for instance, the chain of command. It's a way of applying to the social system this sort of deterministic approach that you use for designing a physical system. And the contrast to that is something called complex systems or complex adaptive systems. And here you have multitudes of independent actors, each seeking to advance their own self-interest based on their image of their environment. And there are often ambiguous decision rules. Such, such systems are not designed, they evolve. And there are no central control points. They, of course, exist in the context of complicated physical systems, uh, the planet Earth with its you know, lithosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere. Uh, but fundamentally, they're driven by um, plants and especially animals that sense their environment and have their own set of priorities and decide how they're going to react to that environment. So for complex systems, you want to think of organic and social systems and similar metaphor. So when you're trying to describe a system, you'll do much better if you use organic metaphors. Another way to think about the distinction is the two kinds of a super duper ultra pool game. With a complicated system, you have one player who's trying to position the perfect shot. And if he gets everything lined up just right, he'll hit the ball and all the other balls will bounce in just to the right places, so the end result will be whatever he wants it to be. And often when we talk about policymakers just having the right strategy, if they had the right strategy, everything would work out, the implicit assumption is that it's a complicated system and it is possible to have the right strategy. Uh, in reality, what you have is a complex system, which is a different kind of pool. So what you've got is not one player, but you have a multitude of folks playing simultaneously, each trying to get the balls arranged in a different way for their own purposes. Uh, the laws of Calvin ball apply, that is to say the rules keep changing, um, and that's part of what makes it so unpredictable. So if you, once you start recognizing that conflict systems look like this, then you've got a series of very daunting challenges to deal with. 
The first, of course, is social complexity. You've got all of these independent actors all pursuing their own agenda, their own self-interest, um, using often very flawed decision-making rules, and how you, that, how you reconcile that gets very, very difficult. And it's even more difficult because there often are not win-win solutions that what people want can be fundamentally incompatible. There is no zone of possible agreement that is an overlap between what two parties want and that they're inherently competitive. The other thing that you'll have is ruthless Machiavellian actors, folks that really seek power over others and are willing to engage in a winner-take-all competition that can be pretty brutal and sometimes very, very deadly. So you need a system that can deal with these folks as well. There's also complexity associated with the way in which people think. So you'll have social complexity, but the human brain is also a complex organ that has all sorts of non-rational and irrational ways of thinking about things. So it's not enough to just come up with a solution that will make sense based on rational cost-benefit calculations. The world is also so complex that we can't even begin to design actions that will get us where we want to go without relying on experts. And there are a whole set of reasons why it's very hard to rely on experts and find ones that are trustworthy and all of that. But it's more than that. There's also the sheer scale of the problem. And this is what is utterly daunting. I was once on a panel with a physicist who was involved in the Manhattan Project. And he was telling us that one of the real privileges of being a physicist is to understand deep down inside what's meant by orders of magnitude, that is, factors of 10. He went on to explain that the Hiroshima bomb was four orders of magnitude more powerful than a conventional TNT bomb, the so-called blockbuster. Um, or envisioned another way, walking around your neighborhood at 1.7 miles an hour roughly is four orders of magnitude slower than buzzing around the planet on the International Space Station. Now the thing that's really daunting is that the difference between your standard mediation triad, you've got party A, party B, and a mediator, and even a moderate size conflict, say Israel and Palestine, is roughly seven orders of magnitude. That is a gigantic quantitative difference. Any quantitative difference that big is a qualitative difference. And we need strategies that can operate on that scale. There's also chaos that you take simple predictive systems and you add them together and you don't have to add very far to find something that seems totally chaotic and unpredictable. In Boulder at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, they have a display in the lobby that explains why they can't predict the weather. And you take the most predictable of simple machines, a pendulum, you hang another pendulum from that pendulum and swing it and it will produce the most bizarre and apparently unpredictable behavior. The other thing about chaos though is it's not totally unpredictable. It's unpredictable within limits. The way Kenneth Boulding used to describe it is that you need to be prepared to be surprised about the future. But then again you don't have to be dumbfounded. There are things that you know that constrain your ability to predict the future in ways that are very, very useful. And then there's the notion of influence limits. I sort of have this image, which I tried to draw here, uh, that we all live in influence clouds and our ability to influence others diminishes with distance from ourselves. And it isn't just straight physical distance, it's distance in terms of sort of personal contact and in the world of the internet that may involve contacts on the other side of the planet, but still we only influence a relatively small number of relatively immediate associates. And that the society actually is this gigantic sea 
of influence clouds. And there's not really any clear place where anybody's got enough influence to push more than a little bit of it uh, in whatever direction they want. So you need a strategy for dealing with conflict that works in such a you know, really squishy environment. Now, part of what we want to do with this seminar is actually start thinking about how one does that, because I don't think it's an impossible challenge, so it seems awfully, awfully daunting. Uh, again, to go back to Kenneth Boulding, who will quote a lot and in many ways is sort of the inspiration of the whole approach that we're taking here, uh, as he used to say that the greatest catastrophe to occur to the social sciences was the success of celestial mechanics. And here for millennia, humans had looked out at the heavens and couldn't figure it out. And then they figured out that, hey, you know, a couple of simple equations will explain the movement of the solar system and the planets and everything with astonishing accuracy. So folks started looking for those same equations, those same um, with respect to social problems. And it's like thinking about the social system as a complicated system that's driven by simple deterministic rules, when in reality it is vastly squishier and all of the rules of complexity apply. So what he advocated, and what we're going to spend a fair amount of time developing in conjunction with these seminars, is an ecosystem-based approach that thinks about the way the world works, not in terms of straight physical laws, but in the evolution of social and biological systems and the ecodynamics that govern the way in which that emerges. At this point, there are two discussion questions that we'd like to raise. First, what do you see as the key challenges posed by complexity that we need to find better ways of addressing? And second, what do you see as the most promising strategies for meeting those challenges?